Well, I think I'll be able to see something with these. Well, yeah, you can see something, but not nearly as much as you could see if you were using the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, the Hubble Space Telescope completely changed the way I look at outer space. I mean, from the star nurseries to all those galaxies, there might be a little Earth-like planet out there somewhere. Well, that's true, but did you know that when Apollo astronauts took photographs of Earth, it really changed the way we look at ourselves? In fact, there are satellites up there all the time, imaging different parts of the Earth and studying it. Well, I could talk about looking at the Earth for a long time, but I only have about 30 minutes. Well, why only 30? Well, because this is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson and I'm coming to you live from the National Air and Space Museum. Today we are in the Space Race Gallery and in the Space Race Gallery we display artifacts that help us explore space. One of our premier artifacts is the Apollo Soyuz test project, which was the first time Americans and Soviets worked together in space. It was often called the Space Handshake. We also have Skylab, which was our first space station. And behind me, we have the Hubble, Pe Hubble Space Telescope that showed us all new views of space and, and galaxies. Now, I'd like to welcome our audience here today, Friendship Charter School. They are here today to help us cel celebrate Earth Day. And to begin, we're gonna talk a little bit for, you can participate online. We have the docents standing by, and if you have a question, we may be able to answer it while we're doing our program. So to get us started today, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Lavasser. She is one of our space history curators. And Jennifer, I know that you have this great collection of photographs of the Earth taken by astronauts. So do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure, absolutely. Astronauts have been photographing the Earth for a really long time. It goes all the way back to 1962, when John Glenn took the very first handheld camera to space. And so he went up into space in the first orbits around the Earth, and he took a bunch of really great photographs. So this is one of the very first ones he took. It looks a little fuzzy, but it's kind of hard to see out the windows. Um, and we started taking better and better cameras as the space program went on. And so you could see how he saw clouds, and um, eventually scientists would study those images. Ed White went outside his spacecraft for the very first time on a spacewalk in June of 1965. And he, his image uh, of him outside the spacecraft was really important for understanding what it was like to be in space. You could see him floating, which was really cool, but also really important for how we understand ast what astronauts do. On Apollo 8 in 1968, they actually took this photograph from the moon. It was the first time people had gone around the moon, and this is called Earthrise. And what it shows is how fragile the Earth is. It's just that little ball hanging out there in the blackness of space. And so we really started to think a different way about Earth. During the Apollo 17 mission, which was the last time astronauts went to the moon, they photographed the Earth as they left Earth. And you can see the whole thing. This is the first time ever that astronauts could photograph the Earth without any shadows. And so you could see how clear it is, but also all those beautiful clouds in the atmosphere. And so this is really the beginning of a movement to think about Earth in a different way. Okay, so they took these photos with cameras. Now, I'm assuming that they're not like my iPhone that I can click on. Would Unfortunately, it? no. Astronauts needed a lot more equipment back, especially in the 1960s. Cameras were not digital like your phones or a little pocket camera you might have today. Astronauts started using Hasselblad cameras. Hasselblad is a Swedish camera. Um, always very um, common in professional photography, but it's a really great camera. It's very durable. And so astronauts used it. And you can see that Hasselblad made some changes for astronauts. Astronauts often wear gloves when they're in their spacesuits. And so they made this really big tab on the side so that they could change the, the focus of the lens. Um, it also uses what's called a magazine. And this is where they keep the film. Now, Cameras are not digital, but we're not digital back then. So there's actually a roll of film inside. It was a roll of film inside here. And this particular magazine was used during most of the imaging 
um, on the way to the moon during the Apollo 11 mission. And the Apollo 11 mission is the first time people landed on the moon. So it makes this camera really, really special. So this one went up with the Apollo 11 mission. And we have a couple of photos, actually, from that mission from this camera. Shall we take a look at them? We do. And what's really cool about some of these photos is just how clear they are. Hasselblads were known for their quality. And so you can see these are really clear images. They're beautiful. The astronauts photographed their way uh, as they were leaving Earth. They also photographed each other. This is Michael Collins. He was the command module pilot during the mission. He was also the director of the museum when it first opened. Uh, and then you can also see things as they approach the moon, because that was their final destination, was landing on the moon. And so they started photographing it as they got closer. OK, so we, I think we've got some questions. We're going to start with an online question. What kinds of cameras do astronauts use to take photos in space today? Well, what's great is about 15 years ago, NASA finally transitioned to using digital cameras, and it makes it much easier to take photos. You can only get about 200 photos on this camera, but on a, ca a camera that they would use today, a digital camera, they can take thousands of photographs, and they just send them back to Earth. Sometimes you see them right away, even on a place like Twitter or Facebook. OK. And we have an audience question. Do you have a camera question for us? Yes. Hello, my name is Jemaya, and I'm from Friendship Real Pierce. And my question is that when you know that when you have a satellite, when you take pictures, how, what kind of pictures, like what kind of camera do you use when you take pictures? What kind of, now there's a difference between these cameras and the cameras we find on satellites, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. The cameras on satellites and even on later Apollo spacecraft were much bigger. They have a really big lens and they're able to zoom in on things that are much, much smaller. And so they can see very wide areas, but their resolution, which is how clear that image is, is much higher. Okay. Do we have a, another audience? Do we, we have an online question. Why is a telescope in space better than a telescope on the ground? Fantastic question. There's one major difference between using a telescope on the ground and in space, and there's the atmosphere. The atmosphere makes images from Earth not quite as good and clear as they would be from space. So when you put something like Hubble out in orbit, it can take much clearer pictures of things that are very, very far away. Thank you so much, Jennifer. No problem. Now, Jennifer showed us what happened when astronauts took photos of the Earth. Now we're going to take a look at what happens when satellites take photos of the Earth. Hey, Andrew, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking at these satellite images of the Earth. The Earth? That's right, the Earth. That doesn't look like the kind of globe we have in a classroom. I can see clouds, but not borders. Yeah, that's right. A lot of times the globes we have in classrooms are political maps. They show different countries. This one is a physical map. It shows things like continents, oceans, uh, and forests, and deserts, and swirling clouds. It's the kind of view that we can only get from outer space. What we're seeing here, we're zooming into southern Africa at this point on the globe. And we're actually looking at something called the Okavango Delta. It's a part of southern Africa where the river, the Okavango River, flows from the upper left to the lower right. And then it slowly dries out as it enters uh, into a desert area. So this is the same picture of the same place. These two images were collected at the exact same time by the exact same satellite called Landsat 7. Why are they different colors then? Well, they're different colors because they're actually using different wavelengths of light. Wavelengths of light? Yeah. There are many different wavelengths of light. Some of them we can see with our eyes. Our eyes have retinas, and they're sensitive to red, green, and blue light. But there are other wavelengths of light that we can't see with our eyes, but they're really useful for understanding the Earth. For instance, there are a lot of wavelengths of infrared light, and that's what we see here on the image on the right. All of this red stuff shows reflectance from sunlight in near-infrared light. And do we have a machine that'll do this, or is it done once the photo's taken? No, we actually launch into space different kinds of imaging detectors that can see visible wavelengths of light, and also infrared wavelengths, and, and others. One of those machines is actually sitting uh, right here in the exhibit. It was actually a sensor called the Multispectral Scanner. It was actually launched on a series of satellites called Landsat, starting in the 1970s up through the 1980s. Five of them were launched, and they collected images that look like these. 
this is just a small part. What if I want something big like the state of Hawaii? If you want to show a big part of the Earth, one of the things you can do is actually take images like these that cover maybe a couple hundred miles on a side and put them together in a computer program, making what we call a mosaic. And that way you can cover large areas that show things like vegetation cover or desert areas, volcanoes, oceans, anything you want to see on the Earth. And why is it important that we collect these images? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do with all of these images is we look and see how the Earth changes through time. We want to understand what's on the surface of the Earth, and we do that by collecting these different wavelengths. And that's important because different kinds of things on the Earth absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light. So using these kinds of machines, we can tell the difference between forests and grasslands and deserts any kind of vegetation and ocean cover. And then by collecting images at different times, we can see how it changes through time. Well, thanks for explaining all that to me. No problem. Well, so now that Andy has showed us some of these images from space, we're gonna have a quiz to see how well you can sort them. Hello and welcome to Stim It to Win It. In today's edition, we have a tough challenge for our friends here. I'm going to give them pictures taken from space by satellites. These pictures fall into one of two categories. Biome one, biome two. Basically, there are two different biomes. I'm not gonna tell you what the biomes are. So you have to look and see which pictures are similar and match them up. I'm gonna start you off by giving you a freebie, okay? Your job is to take this picture and say, does it match something here, or do you think it's a completely different biome? What do you think? Make a choice. You think right there? All right, good job. All right, your turn. Take a look at this picture. Where do you think it goes? Do you think it matches these? Or do you think it needs to go to a different spot? All right, good job. Yep. All right. There's yours. Do you think it matches these or do you think it matches this one? Okay, good. Let's do this one. Think it, well, hmm, this might be an easy choice. And last but not least, good job. Guess what, guys? You got all six of them correct. Way to go. Now, let's see what these biomes are. Here we have biome one. These are all pictures of deserts. Biome two, these are all pictures of forests. So all of these pictures taken from space, either of forests or of deserts. And one of the really cool things is, when we look at pictures from space of Earth, we can actually learn about other planets. This is what we call an alluvial fan. On Earth, it is caused by water, okay? When we go to pictures of space, you'll see the black and white picture is a crater on Mars. We see the same type of feature on Mars that we have here on Earth. And we know that on Earth, it's caused by water, we can make some assumptions that that same type of feature was caused by water on Mars. Beth, these guys did a great job on Stim It to Win It. Back over to you. Thank you, Marty. Now, we're really lucky in Washington, D.C. We can see these sort of different environments live and in person with our friends at the Botanic Gardens, and we got a chance to visit them. I am here at the U.S. Botanic Garden. Inside are plants from all over the world. Let's go see what's growing on. I am standing in the middle of a jungle in the middle of Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, the United States Capitol is only about a thousand feet that way. This jungle and all jungles are important to me and to you. Come along with me as we find out why jungles are so important.
I'm joined by Lee Koikendall, the children's education specialist here at the U.S. Botanic Gardens. Lee, tell me, why should I care about the rainforest? Well, have you ever heard the expression lungs of the planet? So we get our oxygen from plants and rainforests are huge areas that have many, many different kinds of plants in them. And so we're getting a lot of oxygen from there. But the other thing is you think of the plant diversity and animal life in a rainforest, everybody should care. Think about this, we, every second, collectively around the world, we are losing a football-sized field of rainforest. Plants and animals we might not have even discovered yet. That's an area the size of this forest every second. Absolutely. Unbelievable. So I really should care about the rainforest. Not only should you care, but everybody should care. Whether you live near the rainforest, whether you've never been to a rainforest, they are essential to the health of our ecosystem, the health of our planet. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, back over to Beth. Okay, so we looked at a lot of different environments so far in the whole Earth. But my question right now is why Earth Day? And to help me answer that, I have Dr. Martin Collins, who's a curator in our Space History Division. And Martin, why is Earth Day important? And how did it come about? What prompted Earth Day? Take a look at this image. It helps us understand the mindset of people in the 1960s. It's a poster from that very first Earth Day event. And people were very much concerned about pollution. Pollution from cars, pollution from factories, pollution from airplanes. It seemed that human activity was overwhelming the environment. If you look closer at the image, you see in the background a tilting image of the U.S. Capitol. And that was an indicator that the federal government had not yet stepped up to the challenge of dealing with pollution. The result was the creation of a social movement, a grassroots movement, the central idea of which was that individuals and communities could take responsibility for the environment to protect it and to conserve it. But it also required specific events and ideas to help energize this idea. Take a look at this image. This is an image of the Cuyahoga River, a river near Cleveland, Ohio. And what we see is the, is, is the river on fire. Think about the idea of a river on fire. It's so contrary to our understanding of how rivers are that it created this vast sort of public interest in the problem of pollution and how it was affecting in the most fundamental way our basic resources like rivers. The other idea that was fundamentally important was one that Jennifer talked about with you. The idea that we saw the earth not just through what was happening in our communities, but we saw the earth as a whole. And one of the ways that this happened was a campaign as evidenced by this button that you see uh, to create an image of the whole earth so people could understand that it was a small, precious place that we needed to take care of. Well, what was Earth Day like itself in April of 1970? Uh, it, it was consisted of major events in, in the primary cities of the United States. What you're seeing here on the screen is a march in New York City down Fifth Avenue, one of the major thoroughfares of the city, an indication of how deeply people felt about this question of how to protect the environment and wanting to get involved. The other part of Earth Day in 1970 was what was called a teach-in. These events in colleges, high schools, and communities around the country by the thousands that told people in very specific ways what they might be able to do to contribute to creating a better environment so that they could take personal action and not worry about what either corporations or governments were doing, but something that they could do in their own lives. And that idea of Earth Day has stayed with us to the present. Okay, so Martin, I think we're gonna take a couple of questions. Do we have an online question? When did Earth Day become recognized worldwide? From the very beginning. Uh, the people who were intimately involved in Earth Day uh, saw this not only as a problem in the United States, uh, but an issue that affected the whole world. Remember that sort of image of the whole planet? It created a conversation, not just here in the United States, but around the world, that protecting the planet was a responsibility of people everywhere on Earth. Okay, we have an audience question. Come on up. What's your question? My name is Nada. My question is how, how do the belly work when you go up to space? How, how what? How do the belly work when you go up to space? How, 
how do you take pictures when you go up to space? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, okay. Jennifer answered that a little bit. It's having certain kinds of cameras that allow you to look down at the Earth uh, and those cameras uh, take pictures. Is it any different than taking a picture here on Earth? Not very much. It's the same basic idea. You have to have a camera that provides you with a certain kind of, of resolution, provides you with the right kind of picture, uh, and then you have to get the image back to Earth. That typically has been one of the challenges, and we have solved that in a number of different ways. Thank you so much, Martin, for You're clearing welcome. that up for us and telling us a little bit about Earth Day. Now we're going to go back to our uh, friends with our friends at the Botanic Gardens. We're going to take a look at another interesting ecosystem. I'm back, and I've moved into the desert area, and I'm joined by Ari Novi, the director of the U.S. Botanic Gardens. It's really hot and dry in here, but there are some amazing plants. How do these all grow in here? Well, thank you so much for having me, and it's really fun to be here in the desert with you today. Um, we often think of the desert as kind of a barren uh, wasteland full of sand, but really plants have found amazing ways to, to make life happen. And they're dealing with uh, the really twin challenge of extreme temperatures, especially heat, but also a real lack of moisture um, and precipitation. And so they have wonderful adaptations like succulent thick stems for storing water, um, very thick skin that makes sure that they, they don't evaporate water and lose it um, during the process of photosynthesis, as well as highly reduced leaves um, and a lot of anti um, herbivory compounds and thorns and things like that as well. Now there's some really interesting plants in here. Can you tell me about some of them? Absolutely. Um, one of my favorites is called the giant Stapelia, or uh, Stapelia gigantea, and it's really neat because not only is it succulent and able to live in the, um, in the in the arid environment, but also it's got to think about pollination. It's got to think about well, you know, I've got to live, but I also have to take advantage of these these insects that are going to allow me to reproduce. And it does that by producing this really ugly, horrific flower. Um, looks kind of like the the really ugly alien in the in the movie Predator. Um, and it not only is really ugly, but it it uh, smells really, really bad, and it attracts these flies that basically like rotting flesh. Um, and so it's able to take advantage not only of, of, um, of, of the desert conditions to live, but also of the insects that live in the desert. That sounds horrible, but awesome at the same time. What other ones do you like in here? I love the barrel cacti. Um, barrel cacti are kind of the, the quintessential cacti. They're large, they have big thorns. Um, and uh, they're really interesting because they're all swollen. They're, they're really a giant swollen stem, and, and that's a, a mechanism for the cactus to conserve water. When, when it does rain, it often pours in the desert, just very infrequently. And so they're able to suck up a whole bunch of water and hold on to it so they can use it later on, even when there's a very, very little rainfall. Interesting. Now, there's another plant that kind of grows in this area, but you don't have it in this room. That's absolutely right. Should we go take a look at absolutely. it? Absolutely. Let's go. All right. This plant's something that we can grow at home, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is aloe, or aloe vera is the Latin name. Um, it's a plant that a lot of us are very familiar with because you can buy it um, pretty much at any garden center, and a lot of people do have it in their homes, both because it's beautiful, but also because um, when you have a burn or a sunburn, the, the, the sap or the juice inside the plant is a really wonderful salve against those burns. So you just can grow this plant at home um, whenever you need to. You snap off a little piece of it, kind of rub it on you, and, uh, and you're kind of good to go. So you've got your medicine right there on your counter at home growing in this plant? It's right there for you. And uh, in fact, in addition to being used as a burn uh, medicine, a lot of uh, traditional cultures also use it as an actually potent laxative, but, but I'll warn you because it is truly potent. Okay. If you'd like to learn more about medicinal plants here at the U.S. Botanic Garden, go to the STEM and 30 website where we're going to post a short video showing you some of these other medicinal plants. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Now back to Beth. Okay, so we've looked at Earth from space, we've looked at Earth from satellite images, and we've looked at some of these ecosystems. But what can you do on this Earth Day? Well, to help us answer that question, we have some friends from Smithsonian Gardens, and Marty's gonna help us answer it. Marty? Like Beth said, today is a day for action. We want you guys to be yeah, able to do something. Job. And this is something that you guys can do in your backyards, and every little bit counts, you know, everything from recycling one water bottle to making a container garden helps our environment. So I'm joined today by Christine price Abelo, and you're a horticulturalist at the Smithsonian Gardens. Tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about what these guys are doing. Sure. These guys are helping us plan up some container gardens. Uh, the great thing about containers is it's something you can do anywhere, whether you have sun or shade or a small space like a balcony, a deck or a patio, or you want to put them out in your regular landscape. You can add a great splash of color or bring in um, pollinators to your garden by planting these containers up. 
And the ones we're doing today are specifically pollinator friendly containers. Um, you can see the guys here, they're planting up these uh, beautiful flowers here. These are actually pentas. They attract hummingbirds uh, because of the red color. Um, we've also got some other samples of containers over here. We've got a, one that's yellow and white and silver. Uh, most of those things bloom in the er early evening or early morning hours when uh, moths are out. The white colors and the silver color foliage attracts moths for that one. That's another type of pollinator. And the large containers beside me here, these are uh, bee and butterfly friendly plants. Bees and butterflies see colors differently than people do. They uh, actually see tracks or patterns on those petals that guide them in to the nectar source when they come in to feed and then the pollen sticks to them and then they take it to the next plant and transfer it over. So we've got the butterfly and bee containers there. And this last one here is a hummingbird container. It's, uh, if you notice, it's all featuring red, full, uh, red flowers on here. A lot of tubular shapes where they'll put a, come in and land on the plants and then uh, stick their little beak down in there, get the nectar and bring it out on them that way. So one thing with container gardening, depending on uh, what kind of pollinators you want to attract, you just want to make sure you have a full sun location so you can get lots of butterflies, bees, things like that uh, visiting your garden. And this is something that you can do even if you don't have a big yard, right? Right, any space, a balcony, a patio, a deck, anything like that. Awesome. Indoors now, too. Now you guys are, the Smithsonian Gardens is sponsoring a competition, correct? Right. Well, we have our annual Garden Fest event coming up that celebrates National Public Garden Day. Uh, it's Friday, May 8th, and we usually have a container contest associated with the event. We invite the public to come in and uh, bring in their containers with them. We display them in the Haup Garden that day and have a, a friendly little judging or competition among the containers for different categories. So if you'd like to participate, there's information on our website that you can uh, look up online and check out the event and come on out. Great. Guys, you're doing a great job with this. There's just one thing that we need to add to it. If we add that right there, this looks perfect <laughs> now. So Beth, I think we need to find a place to keep this. I think the studio might be a great spot for this. <laughs> Studio would be a great spot for this. So we have time for one very quick online question. How much worse is pollution now than it was in 1970? So pollution today is much less than it was in 1970. Uh, a, a variety of, of uh, federal laws have helped clean up the air and the water. Uh, people have taken steps individually to uh, help the environment by not throwing plastic bags out their car windows to recycle. Uh, today, the, the, uh, the, the pollution is a much lower level than it ever was in the 1970s. Well, that, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank Christine and Martin and Jennifer and Andrew for helping me out. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Boeing, and we hope to see you all again next month on May 20th when we'll talk about living and working in space. I'm looking forward to the living, yeah. the living and working in space one. Yeah, yeah.